Good morning and afternoon, everyone. Welcome to your Fast Track Friday Hangout uh, for Autodesk HSM. This week we have Tim Paul, master machinist and a, a Jedi master at Autodesk. Tim Paul is going to talk about a, his part review uh, and some of the awesome fixtures and parts that he's uh, going to walk us through today. So welcome, Tim. Can you give us a little bit of overview of what we're going to look at today? So I'm sure uh, Wayne was saying uh, that, that I'm jumping on with you guys. It was kind of a last minute thing. I was asked to jump on and show you guys uh, a recent project I worked on. I was just making some bottle openers and uh, a lot of people on Instagram, if you don't follow me there, it's uh, One Year Tim. A lot of people on Instagram were mentioning uh, they would like to know more about the little little pallet fixture that I made. So I think we're going to review that, talk about some Mighty, mighty Bite fixtures, uh, some of the kind of fixturing decisions I made and, and whatnot. So with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Alan Wayne. Yeah, for, for it should be exciting. Every machinist sort of has a unique way of attacking a part, so we thought it would be exciting to have uh, Tim sort of walk through his thought process for, for machining a part. Hopefully it's helpful for everybody. And yeah, I'm always always glad to jump in. Thanks, Tim. It's great to have you here. And uh, for our audience, I mean, this is a great opportunity to pick Tim's brain. Um, there's a lot of information in there. So while we're here, um, it would be great to have you guys, uh, ha we have an open dialogue. So anytime you guys might have a question for Tim, uh, please feel free to ask. Al and I will be monitoring those questions. So this is a great way to, to get a one-on-one -on -one and ask those questions as uh, Tim is going through his presentation. Um, and also I want to mention, stay on. For those of you, stay on past the, the, our time a little bit because uh, Al and Tim are going to give us some uh, previews of what's to come, what's happening right now in development, what we can look forward to in the near future uh, with, our, with development for our CAM. So again, please feel free, use the questions panel, ask some questions, we're going to monitor them and we'll get those questions over to Tim and, uh, and you can pick his brain and ask a master machinist and, the, uh, uh, and Tim uh, to be able to uh, get an answer for you. So cool. With that, um, I would like to ask you guys a couple quick poll questions before we get on to the presentation. Um, the first thing I'd like to know is what is it that is most likely to help drive your, your growth in your business? We do ask this uh, each week for our attendees because it's really helping us to know uh, exactly where we can apply our development as well as add content in our adoption uh, as well as uh, all of our websites uh, and our YouTube videos to, be, to make sure that we have um, our uh, training information and, uh, and uh, uh, documentation out there for you guys to be able to learn and grow. And also this information is used to go back to our development team to know where we're, we're going to focus within the next year uh, to be able to bring those tools to you to help you grow your business. So I can see you guys are voting. I really appreciate your taking the time to, uh, to take this poll and let us know exactly where uh, we can really apply and focus our efforts to help you guys out, help you grow. So it looks like the majority of you have voted. I really appreciate that. I'm going to close out the poll real quick. And I'm going to share it with you guys. So it looks like we have 50% of our audience is really looking to get more true four or five axes. Um, this is definitely helpful for us to know uh, going forward where you guys are really looking for us to develop and provide more content for you. Um, so cool. Very cool. Thanks for voting, guys. I'm going to close this out real quick. And one more. Oh, go ahead, Al. I'm sorry. I was going to say we're not going to show it today, but seeing all that four and five axis uh, peaks, maybe we need to take a peek at, um, at the blend tool path in, in an upcoming webinar at the, the final end. Blend, if you don't know, is the uh, true five axis strategy that we're working on. Yep, that would be awesome. For those of you who join us each week, stay on and you can see uh, the blend toolpath as Al had mentioned and we'll be able to uh, go through some of that development to show you where we're at now and how that's really going to be a great toolpath to help you guys. Get something else for today. Mine won't be today, but we'll, in the future we'll, we'll look at it. We'll right. Look at awesome. Thanks, Al. Uh, one more quick poll question for you guys. I uh, just want to know, because we're getting close to November, uh, in, in uh, Las Vegas at the Venetian uh, this November, the 14th through 16th, we're going to have our Autodesk University. It's really a great chance for you guys to attend 
uh, to meet some of those elite users out there, some of our advanced development uh, team. Uh, you get to meet Al and Tim will be there, uh, as well as CJ and uh, Angelo uh, at Pier 9. And we're going we're gonna to have uh, a lot of classes from, like, I think Rob Lockwood's going to be there uh, this year to teach uh, Lawrence. Uh, the the all stars that you see in our, our forums who are answering our quest your questions every week or every day uh, they'll be there as well so it's a great opportunity for you to experience be, to be uh, attend some hand on hands on classes as well as the keynote speakers uh, meet some of those elite users uh, like yourselves and uh, and to learn and so it's a great opportunity and a great place to go. Uh, to learn more about our CAM. So it's really going to be CAM heavy this year, uh, and you're going to learn more about machining, hands-on classes, so I highly recommend signing up and uh, attending Autodesk University. So again, thanks guys. Thanks for taking the time to take the poll. Uh, it looks like the majority of you have voted, so I'm going to close out and we'll take a look and share. So it looks like uh, there's still we still have a lot of people who'd like to know how to get there. They want more information uh, to find out how we can get to Autodesk University in just a few minutes. Al's going to give us a little bit more of an insight on what's happening and uh, what's going on with Autodesk University this year. But uh, it looks like we uh, we have a lot of you who are uh, making some chips this year and uh, we'll be able to, uh, to catch up on what was happening uh, from the recordings. So again, thanks for taking that poll question, guys. We just want to find out where you are as far as uh, wanting to get to or where you're at with knowing about Autodesk University. So I'm going to hand it over to Al uh, to give us more insight on what's happening this year with Autodesk University. So Al? Uh, thank you, Wayne. Uh, so obviously, um, for everybody that don't know, it, AU is, is made up of a lot of classes, and, and all of those classes um, are, are taught by experts and uh, from Autodesk and from the user community. But in conjunction with all the classes, there's a lot of social networking opportunities. So I just want to make sure that you don't just look at this list and say, well, AU is a few classes. Uh, you got to keep in mind that we're, we're networking with, with all these other Oh, Al, it sounds like your uh, audio is, uh, is is fading out there as well. One dedicated day, so if you don't want to go to all of AU, you can come to a dedicated day where, where you'll experience the product innovation platform. That's what we talk about, is this idea of bringing together design, manufacturing, all into one environment. So Garen's, Garen's driven a day around that. You can reach out to him. Um, I've got his email address here, or myself, uh, for details on how you get that one specific day on Tuesday. Uh, you can still attend the keynotes and, uh, and whatever after events in the exhibit hall. Um, all of AU, so throughout uh, the three days of AU, there's classes taught by many different users, everything from running a machine shop by guys like Seth, um, multi-axis programming from people like Amish and, and uh, Lawrence, um, multitasking machining, uh, many very uh, deep dive CAM topics, far more than we've had the opportunity in the past. And then on the last day, on Thursday, there will be another dedicated day um, for people that are wanting to really dive deep into CAM and, and work their way through uh, starting with the core concepts and diving into each area of CAM, and that's going to be driven by Tim Paul, but that's another single day experience, which again is unique to AU, um, but think of that as going Yeah, hey, it seems like your audio might be fading day. out a little. Oh, my apologies. Uh, how much of what I said did you miss? Uh, just a little bit, just like sounded like you're just getting a little choppy. Yeah, just a little choppy there. So I was just going to say that that last day, Tim is sort of spearheading that last day. But the the idea is instead of um, all of the other classes that are all great that are deep dives by experts in five axis and multitasking, on that class uh, that's threaded together on machine presentations. At, uh, on the show floor. So uh, lots of exciting things happening at AU. As I mentioned, many expert speakers. Uh, so Rob Lockwood from Oculus, it's part of Facebook. John Saunders is going to talk to us about how you 
bring social media into um, your small business. Seth, um, Lawrence, uh, and many of the Autodesk team, Renee Fonseca, who is our uh, architect of the post system and the machining kernel, uh, is going to do a deep dive on post processors. Uh, great opportunity again to both network and learn. So I thought we'd take a few minutes to just talk about uh, what's going on at AU. Here's a quick little tease for, for that product innovation platform day where you'll work through everything from the integrated circuit design through uh, prototyping it and leaving with a, with a part. So before we turn it over to Tim and just staying in vain with learning, I did want to give a plug to Tim's team. Tim works on the fusion adoption team uh, and they focus on producing content to help people uh, really become successful with fusion. Uh, they just launched a, a virtual training site uh, with a series of videos. They're broken into short segments, so a minute, some of them five minutes, uh, but very well uh, structured content. It's very good content. I've had a chance to review it. Uh, many might know that uh, in a previous career, I, I worked on content like this, and it's it's exciting to see Autodesk delivering it directly to customers. Um, so with that, uh, Tim, let's go ahead and make you presenter. Uh, we'll Great. go ahead and be able to see Tim's uh, screen, and uh, really what our goal here is to uh, have Tim walk us through a part and see if we can't learn from uh, Tim's years of machining. Yeah, thanks, Al. Thanks, Wayne. Um, so last thing on that adoption content, uh, it's it's continuing to grow more and more. Um, what we're hoping to do with the AU classes, not to not to give um, too many plugs on what we're doing, but what we're hoping to do on the AU classes is kind of supplement uh, those that adoption content. So it's not going to be just a regurgitation of what we've already done, but but a, a chance to get live with some people and and uh, add some more value and a little deeper deeper depth than we're, we're doing with the adoption content. So hope, hope to see a bunch of people in Vegas. With that said, uh, tell the story about this part real quick. I did a, uh, a bottle opener demo for, uh, I think it was a Haas demo days, and uh, it seemed to be a pretty big hit. I started, uh, you know, shared the file with uh, some of our HFOs, you know, the Haas, Haas dealers, and we started kind of making them around the country. So. Uh, if I didn't already plug the Instagram one ear Tim, uh, I, I get to see and do a lot of cool stuff, and I, I try to share it on there. Uh, one of the things I did was uh, we had a Machinist Geek meetup that has uh, died off a little bit up in the Sacramento area, but uh, we're going to revitalize it here soon. I wanted to make uh, some some fancy bottle openers for the people that that joined joined our meetup group. And uh, so I knocked out these bottle openers, and I wanted to, to give them to everybody that, that joined the meetup. So I wanted to make a bunch of them pretty quick, and uh, so I made this fixture. So to give a quick overview of what's happening is we have in one pallet, we have the two first operation parts uh, that just holds the, um, I go to this view here. Uh, with a, a Mighty Bite pit bull, the, the knife edge pit bull, it holds the stock right here up and pushes it up against the Mighty Bite talon gripper. So hopefully you guys are familiar with these. If you're not, I would I would recommend you you learn about them. I don't believe uh, applying you know one process to every situation is 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 awesome, but I think the more well rounded we know about all the different tools available to us, uh, the more awesome we can all be. So. Uh, the little Talon Mighty Bite Gripper uh, needs, I believe, um, I don't actually remember what they specify, but I always set my depth to where this three-quarter inch uh, Talon is, you know, 70 thousandths above the surface the stock is sitting on. And to be honest, I usually give myself, you know, 100 thou or so, so I have some wiggle room. But that little guy... Quarter inch end mill will uh, easily, you know, pull a 25 horsepower, you know, cut 
without pulling the material out with a couple, you know, setup like this. Obviously, I'm not telling you to, to go do that without some, some testing and validation on your side, but um, I would encourage you to, to learn more about these. So on this, we have two first operations that are held in that way. This way, with this pallet, I'll, I'll explain the bottom in a second, but with this pallet, what you can do is on the bench, while this is, you know, one of these is being machined in, in the machine, on the bench you can be swapping parts. So that's what I did, is I made two of these fixtures, and then I was load, you know, you load one up while the other machines, while the machine's running, you have very low, literally, you know, 15, 20 seconds of, of downtime on your spindle between swapping parts. If this was, you know, another very valid way to do this would be maybe, uh, you know, have two vices, hold your first operation in one vice with, with some talon grippers, and on your second vice have, uh, you know, maybe some soft jaws cut with some pockets and some soft jaws for the second operation. It's actually how we've made some uh, at these demo days. It's a pretty common workflow. But uh, you have to make sure you get the pockets really clean uh, so your part's not, you know, sitting up at an angle or whatever. And that, that could take a, you know, a minute, minute and a half of, of downtime. Uh, I think we were down a little under two minutes at the trade shows. So as you guys all know, you know, seconds add to minutes, minutes add to hours. So uh, I was really just playing around. So this is the very, you know, we'll get into more of the details on the first operation of this, but I wanted to show you something I've been doing for a lot of years. Uh, I've played with, you know, the laying, you know, work holding system. I've played with numerous different quick change pallet systems. Uh, and I'm not going to say anything bad about any of those. They all have a place, and they're all awesome. So I want to make sure I'm not telling everybody that this is, you know, the best way. But it is. It's another valid way to make, uh, you know, a quick change pallet that is is pretty inexpensive. Um, it's it's quick and easy to make, and uh, it, it's it's worked for me pretty well. So the way this is set up is. And you can see it's just got uh, this the vice grabs on each side of here, and it has a machine stop. I've played with this machine stop quite a bit to minimize the the uh, you know the chance of a chip getting in here or in here. But I can tell you the chips don't generally build up there because it overhangs your vice. Uh, maybe you'll get some chips here and here, but they're easy to blow off, kind of wipe off. So my workflow would be. You know, cycle's done, you pull the pallet off. I have a lint-free paper towel that I would wipe, you know, the jaws with. It's super important to make sure your jaws are as accurate as you want this setup to be or as repeatable as you want this setup to be. So uh, anybody that's worked with me knows that I'm, I'm pretty, pretty picky about getting my jaws and vices lined up in my machine. Uh, the reason I do that is because I want to be able to take a fixture like this in six months and put it back on there and not worry about it being, you know, this, you know, jacked up this way or this way or, or this way. What, is, what is it? I think one of the first things I learned like, when I was machining is garbage in, garbage out. But, that is, uh, I heard, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, I heard Gigo for probably the first six months of being in a machine shop and I probably nodded my head like I knew what they were talking about. And uh, finally, I realized what what Gigo meant, and I'm a I'm a big believer of that now. Um, and and the vice alignment is a perfect example of that. So, if I have my vice, you know, twisted in the machine like this uh, by, you know, one thou, uh, which is the first shop I worked at, that was kind of their system. You know, the vice should be you know square to the square to the uh, or parallel with the y axis uh, to one thou. But which was a totally fine workflow for them, but they they didn't do any fixtures like this. You know, they every time they put a set of soft jaws in, they they machined them square, so it was square to the to the spindle. And then pretty pretty sure it's one valve this time, and it's one valve the other way the next time, and there you go. Exactly. Yeah, uh, John Saunders has a really good way of saying, uh, and of course it's slipping me now, but. Essentially, your chamfers are the thing that often kind of highlight your misalignments, right? Yeah. So, so if this was, you know, machined, 
uh, your your vice was you know thou off this way, but the whole fixture was machined that way, and then six months later it was this way. Uh, you know this is a pretty big chamfer, but you know often you have you know a ten thou chamfer uh, that could you know you take one thou two thou from one side added to the other. Uh, that's 20% of your chamfer width, and it's real easy to make a, a, a part that still might be in spec or, you know, meet the specification and make it look pretty bad, um, you know, just because of a stupid chamfer. So, uh, I'm not that. getting a vice dialed in within tenths. It's, it's not hard. It's just... Become... Yeah, a little bit of practice. So, a good friend of mine just hired a new machinist, and... Uh, you know, of course, the guy said he was awesome. So, um, you know, he just handed him some vices to, to, you know, two vices to, to line up to a, uh, in a table. And, um, you know, he went and checked it. And it, sure enough, it was within a thousandth of an inch of each other and square to the machine. So, you know, to that guy, it was awesome. Um, so it's, it's kind of setting your own standards. I'm not telling everybody to go out and, and align their vices to one-tenth, but... Uh, if just be aware of what the kind of the ramifications are. So if your vice, uh, if that works for for your setup and workflow, then then fine. If you're throwing the soft jaws away after, which a lot of people, it's a pretty valid workflow. Um, but if you at least make sure you know how uh, and that you're capable of aligning a vice to a tenth, um, you, you'll find that you know two or three times of doing it, and you'll kind of come up with your own system. I've got my system. I'm sure it's better than Al's. Uh, <laughs> just kidding, obviously. Um, I'm sure mine's better than yours. But <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's my point. Come up with a system. Practice a little bit. Um, but that the garbage in, garbage out really, really matters when you get into uh, reusing fixtures. So that, that you know, two or three minute uh, dialogue was was focused on that. So if we if we turn this back over. So you yeah, put a quick question on this too. Here. Yeah. So did you did you pre-make a bunch of these blanks to just be ready, or would you make these um, as you needed? And then question for the people in the audience too: um, any similar sorts of ideas for these pallet systems that are not off oh, the shelf, yeah. making your own pallets? I'm, I'm curious to know how. You yeah, I would love to see what other people do. Um, there's a lot of, of uh, so I'll answer your question in a second, but there's a, a ton of very good, um, you know, a reasonably priced to super expensive, uh, you know, off-the-shelf options, right? You know, Lang's one of them. Uh, Pearson Workholding makes a phenomenal okay. system. Um, yeah, but this is a this is another valid option that that I think people should should always have in their toolbox. So, I can tell you when I worked in a shop, my my, you know, the let's just use the last shop as an example at L3 Communications. You know, our job was to uh, make low volume and prototype stuff very very quickly. So I I would have a number of uh, plates like this, um, you know, stock that was ready to to make these with. I didn't do the bottom side, um, you know, pre-machine them or anything because I wanted to kind of machine them specifically to, to what I needed. But I did have a template set up to essentially machine, you know, all these features together. So if we if we look at this, you know, I'm going to machine a, a bottom fixture that exact same way every single time, right? Um, so I'll, I'll just highlight all of these and, uh, and store as a template. And maybe I'll, uh, you know, I'll put, um, you know, one ear Tim, you know, fixture. Uh, because, again, the, the reason I'm making this fixture is because I want to speed my life up, right? So the next time I make a setup, I'll create from, from a uh, template and use that. And it'll dump all those, all those in there. So I can just regenerate this one toolpath. You know, so most of these I'll just be able to hit regenerate and, and very, very quickly. Some of them are going to require some geometry selections, but um, you can see, you know, how how easy you can you could add those uh, toolpaths with the template. To me, it never really made sense to kind of pre-make this side, especially because I liked, you know, that kind of brings up this point. Uh, I like to be able to note, you know, what's going on with the fixture, right? So this is the one-year Tim bottle opener. 
this is the stock it's it's going to be used you know one one and three quarters by three quarters and cut to uh, three point nine three that's kind of an odd number but that's what the stock was cut to and then the program number for the first and second operation so uh, some people ask me about these uh, to be completely honest I you know I make fake parts for a living so I gotta you know take the time to do some fancy little hand grab uh, where probably in real life I would just make a, a pocket that your fingers could could get in and get some grip this isn't the heaviest fixture but it's it's also not very light when it's dripping wet with slick coolant the last thing you want to do is take a, a, a fixture and drop it on that note um, my general workflow would be to make two of these sides uh, is what you what you want to end up with so you make two of these sides um, first so they're all machined the same and then I, I set it up to um, you know put in this way in the vise so the hard jaw is here and it sits against the hard jaw there so I would put that in make sure my vise is super clean everything's super dialed put it in make the part put the next one in make the part so they're using the same setup I mean the same setup the same everything right the only the only reason they would be you know misaligned like this uh, it's probably a bad habit to show you um, would be if, if you if you got some lint or chips or whatever but I can tell you on this particular job I made two of these and then down here you know, kind of tell the operator the uh, when you're probing for the for the next operation. You know, this is your Y surface, this is your X surface, and then probe the Z right there. So you can do that uh, between cycles every time you change the palette. But I make a habit before I even load all the parts in. You know, I I put it in, I probe there, and I put the next one in, probe there. And this particular setup was within, you know, like one or two tenths. It was, it was uh, surprising uh, how how accurate they can be. I'm not saying it's going to be one or two tenths between, you know, the the first part and the thousandth part because you're going to start getting little nicks and and different things. But it's this system is well within a half thou if if you don't abuse. Uh, abuse your your parts so I usually would take this and put it on a, a couple sheets of cardboard so you're not you know accidentally setting it down on you know a screw or something because you know like anything if you if you nick to you know put a big half thou dent right here your parts gonna be rotated up a half thou so if you if you've worked with me you've probably heard me overuse the term the devils in the details and, and in fixturing the the details really really matter so <coughs> excuse me um, so the grab handles, I think, I think they're personally, I think they're important. I've seen people bolt them onto the sides. In my opinion, if you're, if you're looking at here, it's really easy to just make a pocket. Uh, this was just fun to, to add some, you know, some different 3D tool paths in there. Uh, I actually made them a little smoother. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to find some pictures of this one, uh, maybe towards the end. Uh, but I ended up. What's easily, that? To your point, it could have easily just been extruded down, at least with a lip, so your fingers don't slide out of it. But I can actually tell you, it would be better to <laughs> to be a two D pocket than this this fancy three D pocket. I ended up machining this almost too smooth, so it was uh, didn't give the the traction of a you know a two D pocket, right? So enough of the first side. That's that's the basic idea, and I I have to say on a three-axis mill with a vise, uh, this is probably the most common uh, fixture I would make. Uh, you get into horizontal machining. There's there's all kinds of other five-axis machining. There's all kinds of other good good work holding. This, this is the way an easy way to make your your vertical machining center into uh, almost as productive as a horizontal. You open the door, you crack the vise open. 10 thou and one pallet slides out and the new pallet drops in and you're off to your bench load the next one it's yeah it's a good workflow i i don't want to you know dog any of the you know like the mitico uh you know pallet changing systems but i've looked real hard at a couple shops that i worked at into buying those um and they're actually a, a really good value um, but we were looking at like cycle time. Those actually take a, a decent amount of time to to swap the big you know table pallet, and 
and often we, you know, it's just simple math, right? If you're honest with yourself and can anal analytically think through, uh, you know, how long one thing takes, how long this takes, uh, I think it's it's not hard to to see the value of this. I think the, the other thing you mentioned that I think is super important for everybody to think about on that backside is just thinking about where chips are going to go. Uh, as we're talking about other, buddies, other people's stuff, you, you talk about Pearson. Um, mm -hmm. You can actually find the Pearson stuff in our CAM samples now, but you'll notice an air gap in the bottom. There's just two pads that it locates on, and the rest uh, he's mm -hmm. left open for that exact reason. You don't want that little chip to, to sit on there and throw everything off. The other thing, if you're not going to talk about it again, I, just, I love how you took the time to engrave it and how you labeled uh, where you uh, where you probe it for X, Y, Z, zero. It's so often people would make soft jaws and they go on a shelf and if, if you can't remember where zero is, they're, they're useless. So taking that extra five minutes to make the notes so you remember when the job comes back six months, eight months, ten months later, uh, otherwise just throw the fixture in the trash because can't pick it back up anyway. Exactly. And I think, um, man, how easy is it to just bore a hole right right here and then use that as your, um, you know, your fixture location, right? And then engrave, you know, X, Y here and whatever. Um, it, it's so easy in this, you know, and the reason to kind of go back to my history a little bit, I've, I've been a SolidWorks user since 99. I think I've used seven different CAM systems. And I always wanted to find this, like, I always wanted to have the same CAD or CAM experience as I had on the CAD side. And that's what drew me to HSM Works is because I wanted to be, a, you know, I designed tons and tons of fixtures. That was kind of my, my job for a long time. And I wanted to, to have this, you know, parametric CAD CAM experience. And that's that's how I found HSM and, and Inventor HSM and Fusion. So it's so easy to add a feature that you can probe. Now we're even offering probing as part of our CAM system. So, yeah, there's just no reason why you wouldn't uh, label it. Um, it. You know, this this labeling is a total function of my my poor memory. So at least I'm I'm smart enough to know and recognize that I've got a crappy memory. So, um, and I've I've made a lot of uh, you know high production fixtures where you might have you know, this thing might get, you know, handed off to three different shifts, you know, so the more, you know, this is one example, right? So I, I probably could have written, uh, you know, push stock this direction because uh, the stock, you know, I machined in two little stops for the stock. Um, for me, this is all I needed. Um, there was times where maybe I didn't know the people running the machines. Uh, I would engrave, you know, uh, you know, push stock against stops in these directions or so something like that. Uh, but also if you get into a shop where you kind of have a, a standardized system, you know, maybe everybody in my shop knows that this is this is what this means. You know, it's push the, the two stock blanks away from each other. So, you know, so on that note, just uh, for the people on the line, if, what kind of what kind of notes do you leave your operators? What kind of notes do you leave yourselves? Does this resonate? Is there other things you'd add? Uh, and I'm genuinely curious. You may know we're working on a product fusion production for helping capture uh, documentation on the shop floor. Uh, so while Tim is talking, feel free to add your comments, questions. Yeah, I would I would love to hear all that feedback. I, I think, um, I, you know, one of the luckiest parts about my job uh, over the last few years is that I got I got to get into a lot of shops and see you know what people are doing you know more awesome than I've ever done and what what people are you know kind of challenged with and, and I think I think with fusion production and kind of integrating all these tools together we can we can solve some of those problems so uh, of course I, I like to think I've got a, a pretty good system but then every time I think I've you know got something dialed in you know, I either come up with a new idea to make it better or I talk to someone like Al and, you know, he has a good idea. So I think as a community, it's kind of our job to, to share the knowledge. And I think that's one of the things that, that Instagram does well. I've always kind of hated, you know, forums because uh, there's seems to be more hate than love. But, uh, you know, community like uh, the Insta Machinist community is pretty cool because people can kind of just share ideas and help each other out. So not not to keep plugging that but it's a it's a neat little thing that people do there so 
I explained what we're doing on the first operation, but uh, maybe you did, maybe you didn't notice these two holes here. Um, what that's doing is on this, uh, I actually haven't worked on the second operation on, on this yet, um, or at least I deleted it. But So I have my stock here, and if I machine down to uh, the height of, you know, just above this, this you know, little stopped dowel pin I machined in, uh, I have solid material here and here, which is seems fine until I flip it over to this side. Now I have, you know, what some people call the hat material or what I would call the carrier material is is up here. And what happens, how do I tighten, you know, these two, uh, you know, the pit bulls on this side? They're covered by, by the stock I was holding on to. So by drilling those two holes there through the stock, uh, now I have access to these two holes here to tighten my material or tighten my second operation. Uh, somebody asked me, well, why don't you just let the, the drill from that, that first operation just make those holes? Uh, that was a tough lesson I learned um, because if this whole fixture is in, you know, off this way or this way, uh, let's, you know, think we're making 2,000 of these or 10,000 of these across three or four different shifts and let's say each shift for whatever reason this who who knows why but this thing shifts around a little bit uh, even if that's a thou or two thou off it's going to put a little extra stress on the drill bits as it's going in there so whenever I know I'm drilling into a fixture I I like to do things on purpose not on accident so uh, I'm going to make these holes you know an amount bigger than the drill that I'm comfortable with that the position might change so uh, I might say that again. So if, if I think my pallet is going to move one or two thousandths, I'll make this five or ten thousandths bigger than my hole. Uh, I just don't want this trying to redirect my drill as it drills through the stock and into the fixture. That Does that make sense? sense? So there's a couple learnings here. First of all, you thought through and realized my stock is going to be the way to do my clamp, so I have to drill a hole through um, through the, the stock so that I yep. can actually Get the Allen wrench onto there. So that's, that's a that's a tough lesson. Hopefully, you only learn once. Yeah. yeah. And the sec the second one was you don't just want to machine down into your your fixture. You want some you want some clearance so you're actually just machining your part and the fixture doesn't cause any deflection for your tool. I think the same can be said often when you sort of are walking all the way around the part. Some some guys will say, well, the first time I cut down past, they'll put a slot through my fixture. Um, but another way of doing it is cutting a slot that's a little wider so you have a, a, a channel for the, the tool to go. Yeah, good point, good point. So I was going to see if I had something else to, to show you about what the point you just made up. But um, So the other thing I see people do often is if, if they're sitting uh, a part down on a fixture. So this is the same deal, right? We have a stop. We have the, the, the parts actually bolt down to the fixture. So we have uh, first operation, you put it on here and you bolt the parts down. So uh, this is going to be sitting on this flat surface down here, but there's a step up here. So I made a little island to make it go up. And I know lots of people, let's say there wasn't that island, but I know lots of people that just bolt that down. And if you wanted to machine pass this by 10 or 20 thousand, they'd just let the, the mill kind of machine around it and kind of make its own little island or slot. Does that make sense, Al? Yeah, it's exactly what I was, well, it makes sense to me because it's what I was describing, but hopefully that makes sense to everybody that's watching. Yeah, so if, if somebody, if that doesn't make sense to somebody, let me, while I talk about the negatives that I see of that, is for one, to me, I, I like to do what I plan to do, and I don't, I guess if, if you're okay with that, I'm not going to uh, condemn you for it, but one thing it does is if you imagine a, an end mill slot, you know, whether it's 10 thou or 20 thou, it's going to run around here. It's going to leave a little sharp edge. Maybe your hand's going to get cut on. Maybe not real bad, but you're going to make 2,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 of these things. Uh, now you're going to have these big old fat callus that you're, you're not happy with. But the other thing is that coolant won't flow off it very nice. Um, chips won't flow off it very nice. Uh, when you're blowing it off, it's just it's another problem when it's so easy to just handle it properly. So on this, this is the second operation. What's that? 
the other bit is just a whole mindset piece and it goes back to this garbage in garbage out thing when you develop habits where you say I'm just going to do it right it actually becomes very fast and it gets you in this mindset that everything you do is is clean the thing I always think about it and maybe there's people in here that don't have a junk drawer in their kitchen but I think everybody's got a junk drawer in your kitchen and once there starts to be like a couple of pens and a notepad and spare piece of string and whatever else went in there, then anything goes in that drawer. And it's the same way with what you work. Once you sort of lower your bar, then where does that line stop? So taking the time to build fixtures right and chamfer things, it just becomes a clean habit that ultimately is faster way of working. Yeah, no doubt. And I think the key there is if you're, if you're trying to do something of quality um, and, it, and you feel like maybe you won't, um, because it takes extra time, I can almost always uh, systemize it to where it becomes an efficient process, right? So, cha you know, chamfering, you know, all these little blind blind chamfers. If you have a process to do it, uh, it's pretty pretty dang quick. If you're doing it once every six months, maybe maybe it's not, right? So I know lots and lots and lots of people that would not chamfer this edge because of the adjacent walls or the uh, you know, the adjacent walls, you know, with the 2D chamfer tool. Uh, I like to think, you know, we kind of came up with this magical solution. Um, it, it's it's a life life-changing thing for me because I used to do these chamfers on everything. I had a system that made it, you know, hopefully more efficient than most people. But uh, our new chamfer tool, not new anymore, uh, you know, that thing's clearing that wall by, by two thousandths of an inch. It's going way down on the on, or way up on the the angled chamfer. You know, I'll share with with you real quick. I, you know, talking about systemizing your your processes. I, you know, I have an expression saved that seems kind of complicated, but it's, you know, it's taking it. It's basically putting it five thousandths away from the top of the the edge of the chamfer, and then it's giving me a two thou clearance from the edge. That two thou, I know that I'm going to make all the features on this part, uh, you know, plus or minus one thou. If I was going to make it plus or minus four, I would probably want a five or six thou clearance. So, the key for me is once I come up with that system and I feel like it's going to work on on most everything I do, I'm going to right click and make that my default. So I can I can quickly apply it to something else. And, and like I said, you now everything you make has that same kind of quality and and finish. So I'm looking at my notes, and we're not not super tight on time, but uh, I want to talk about this is kind of some ideas and, and principles that that can apply to not just a fixture like this, but they can also apply to uh, soft jaws. Actually, before I do that, let's talk about what's what's going on here. So we kind of have like a half of what what a lot of people would make a soft jaw, right? And then we're just pushing it in with these blunt brass. Uh, pit bull clamps. These are Mighty Bite product. Let me take a look at it from this view real quick. Um, yeah, so the way the way this works is it's a blunt edge instead of this sharp edge. And if you're worried about micro scratches, uh, which a lot of people are, um, these are going to be uh, hard anodized, so they get a pretty decent etch before they um, before they get anodized. So any little kind of micro scratches, uh, which kind of can look horrible uh, with like color anodizing, but uh, the the extra etch from hard anodizing is going to get you know got rid of them just fine. So um, and the brass, it's you know softer material. So they also make blunt steel ones, but enough of that. So what we're going to do here is we're going to just make a pocket for this this thing to sit in against an index on. I'm going to zoom in on this uh, the crotch of this this corner here, and you can see the fixture is actually pulled away from the corner. Uh, I learned most of my lessons have been hard lessons, and that was one that I learned the hard way. Uh, I see a lot of people, you know, just literally mirror the exact shape of the part. Um, and actually, I, I wish I did something different here. I'll explain in a second, but. I see people mirror the exact shape of a part and then have issues with the parts pulling out or, or you know, all kinds of issues. And generally, whenever I use an internal corner, I, I try to, for whatever reason, internal corners sure seem to screw me harder than uh, 
probably shouldn't say that. Sorry. They they sure seem to to get me harder than uh, external corners, right? So I don't fear external corners too much, but in, internal corners, I always kind of pull my corner away. The way I think about it is this this ang flat angled surface and this flat angled surface, the the size could of the part could change. And if the size of the part changes, uh, these angles are still going to be the same. So whenever possible, I try to try to grab the bigger, broader, you know, surfaces to, to index off of. And I almost always, especially the tighter the corner, uh, the more I care about it. Um, if I was going to change something on this fixture, and it, it didn't actually affect me, you know, I made a, I don't know, a hundred, a couple hundred of these things. It didn't affect me, but if I was going to make this again, uh, the, the pocket I would have I would have kind of pulled out like this. I wouldn't have matched this this arc. You know, I would have just come straight up, you know, tangent from this and come over like that. So really all I was looking for was was something to stop the part on this end. You can see these mighty bites. I, I angled them to kind of push the part that way. Um, this here kind of locks, you know, this angle and this angle lock the part from moving left and right. And uh, it worked great. I, I faced off, you know, the top of this part at like 400 inches a minute or something with a, a two-inch face mill, and I had, I had no issues of of it lifting. Yeah, I think but, I think people can under, and hopefully we're not being too trivial in this, but people can uh, not think enough about how internal corners, how hard they can be, and the cutter can kind of suck in and cut cut a different size, and like you said, it causes a problem. So a couple tricks on that. One, I love that you showed. Um, show that you sort of made that external corner bigger to leave clearance. It, it wasn't going to change the XYZ, the XY location anyway. Your other services did that. Mm -hmm. um, the other is I, I assume that your internal radius you cut is larger than the radius your cutter. So just a, another little radius trick. If you've got a quarter inch or a half inch cutter, it's a quarter inch radius. You don't want quarter inch inside radius, uh, inside corners you want inside corners are like 275,000. So the cutter can roll through it instead of uh, pulling in and producing an incorrect uh, internal corner. Look at that, Tim and I, we have the same. Uh, yeah, we're like twinsies. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, I can share with you uh, my best practices. So my last job at L3 Communications, I, uh, I kind of filled a manufacturing engineer role towards the end of, of my job there. And one of one of the jobs was to come up with best practices. So that was one of them. And to be honest, the shorter the pocket or the 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 shorter your flute length, the more forgiving it is. But my one of my design rules was internal corners. You know, a lot of engineers would design this knowing I was going to go in there with a quarter inch tool. They would design that to 125 thousandths, often thinking they're doing me a favor because they, they you know, thought it through, knew that I had to be at least half the tool. Um, the problem with that is that you get a big load spike, you get all kinds of issues going into a corner. If you look at a tool path that goes through that corner, if it was 125 with a quarter inch tool, it would go straight along this wall and it would make a hard turn. There would be a solid point where, like Al said, that's 137.5. I guarantee you that's a, a man, I don't want to do the math. It's probably 15 or 20 percent bigger than the tool that I was putting in there. My, you know, design rules that I, I came up with at L3 were uh, the corner needs to be at least 20 or no, at least 10 percent bigger uh, than the than the uh, corner. Uh, if it's four times the diameter, you know, so the depth is four times the diameter of the tool, you can go down to five percent if it's if it's two uh, two times the diameter or smaller. Um, I'm a I'm kind of a visual learner, so I hope I didn't uh, lose you guys there. But. So you brought up an interesting, different, interesting point, and I like the format this webinar is taking with just kind of talking through it. But a bit of career advice <laughs> I realized too: you you went in as a machinist, and you yeah. became a manufacturing engineer, and I think that's very inspiring for all the machinists on the line. Engineers have a very laser focus on solving the engineering problem, and and often, by no fault of their own, they forget the manufacturing problem. So I found the same thing. I'd get engineering drawings, and don't be afraid to push back on engineering and say, "This radi what is this for? This radius could change. You shouldn't always just say, well, this is what the engineer said, so I'm going to make it like this. Be confident to push back and say, what does this mean? Can we modify this to, 
to fit the needs, and then you may find yourself like Tim in the manufacturing engineering role because of your manufacturing experience, even though you started your career as a machinist. So, complete yeah, aside, I think it's important to hit on. On that note, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I mean, since we're kind of free form talking about it, it, it was. Uh, the whole reason I had that position as to start a machine shop for L3 was because they were designing parts that they kept getting no no quoted. And one of my early mentors uh, who owned a machine shop I worked for uh, talked about a lot of the jobs that he got from big companies like Aerojet and Lockheed and these guys were because uh, they would send us a part and he would quote it. And he would he would recognize, you know, use an example, a six-inch deep pocket that the engineer thought he was doing a favor by, um, you know, yeah, I want a 625 tool to go in there. So he would, he would uh, make the corner, uh, what, 312, right? Um, so the owner would, would acknowledge that, and he would go back to the company and say, hey, I can make it for this. Uh, you know, maybe we got to EDM the, the corners of the pocket or whatever. Uh, and or we could do it for a quarter of the price if all you did was open up that corner by, you know, 15% or 20%. And he said he got a ton of work because he, he took the time to explain to the customer, you know, what was really driving the price of, of his parts up. And it built that relationship with the customer that, that he's still, you know, those customers are still loyal to him today. So I, I took that. It wasn't a new thing. I took that on to my career. And when I was at L3, I would, I would go to the engineers with the same thing. I would go to the, uh, the uh, QA department with, you know, some questions about their, their uh, rejections. And we just had an open dialogue. And, and by the time I left, I was, I was uh, you know, running the manufacturing engineering position and then also the, you know, the metrology uh, because, you know, it's just those open communications and being able to share your, your actual manufacturing experience um, with your customers or while you're designing your own stuff is, is a huge, huge thing. So uh, it's important to note when you are programming something um, or designing something, you can, uh, if you add a fillet to something, uh, of course I filleted everything <laughs> on this part. Um, if you wanted to fill it something, uh, you can type in a value and then just do times 1.1. It's giving me a red because it can't fill it this, but it's important. You know, that's, I don't, I don't think about it. I just say I want to use, uh, you know, eighth inch radius times 110%. So it's it, sometimes if you ever look at my parts, the, the radiuses are kind of odd because the internal ones at least because that, you know, I, I just do it the math real quick because I know I want to be 10 or 15 or 20 percent bigger than the than the corner. So uh, with that, I'll get back to this internal corner thing. Um, this also applies to soft jaws. I generally try to uh, let the part think about the part growing and shrinking. Um, so if this part was, you know, I have a plus or minus five thousand. I mean, it's a bottle opener, so I I could get away with all kinds of tolerances, right? So if I really wanted to make lots and lots of these, I would have changed how it contacts this upper part, I would have changed how it contacts this lower part, and really focus on trying to index it just off these two flat surfaces. Maybe I would do some probing or something like that if, if the true uh, position of, of this chamfer or whatever was, was important. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, some people are asking me about this kind of funky surface here. Uh, this may or may not be a great example of it, but one of the things I've found, uh, I'm going to talk about this channel up here and I'm going to talk about this down here, is that these Mighty Bytes are awesome tools, um, but as you can imagine, little tiny chips, and I chamfer everything, so I make lots of little tiny chips. Uh, after making a hundred of these, or two or three or four thousand, whatever, uh, it's not uncommon that this area down here gets full of little tiny chips or maybe one or two big chips and then a bunch of little tiny chips. Um, one of my other hard lessons is I see a lot of people make pockets for these Mighty Bite you know, uh, pit bulls that are just pockets, not a slot. Uh, whenever possible, give the coolant a place to come in here and wash stuff out. 
Um, if if this was truly a uh, a more higher volume uh, fixture, uh, I would have made some holes, you know, in between these these three areas here, um, so the the coolant could could come in here and wash chips down here. In reality, they're only going to wash it out of here and then back into here. Uh, I made, like I said, I made quite a few of these. didn't have any problems, but that's kind of what's happening here as well. I want to give, um, if I made this a big floor, if I made this floor the same height as that floor, it would have kind of achieved what I wanted. But over the years, I've noticed that the sooner you can get them to fall off a shelf, the better. Um, that's just... Uh, you know, pain of learning, I guess, um, as I've, I've struggled with lots of different fixtures. Um, basically, you know, I'm indexing these parts on, on this shelf up here. Uh, this, the smaller I can make that shelf, the less likely it is that, that the chips are going to sit there and, and get under the part. Definitely not saying this is the ultimate fixture, but I did incorporate a lot of my kind of painful lessons I've learned. Um, and I had just like an hour, maybe two hours to, to dream it up and design it. So um, the other thing I was going to mention was this kind of, let me see if I'm smart enough to uh, quickly turn off one of these. So you can see what it looks like underneath the part is I didn't just, you can see I could have just set the part on this surface and this surface, but... Uh, I think I mentioned, I kind of let go of my space pilot here. I think I mentioned I'm facing that carrier material off uh, at like uh, 400, 300, 400 inches a minute. It was, you know, I was trying to, trying to impress everybody. And by not adding that shelf there, I'm 100% sure this thing would have chattered in the middle here. Uh, even though I was pinching it in the middle, uh, anytime, you, the more you can support it, the better. I also knew, uh, so on that note, things to think about, is I machine this floor and this floor with the same tool on the fixture. So essentially, they're going to be as accurate, a lot accurate <laughs> along the Z as my machine is to, to handle that. So I'm looking, we're almost out of time, but let me finish uh, the thought on this. So when I make the part, I know that it indexes off of two surfaces. So I always, so I also finished this surface and this surface. I finished those in the Z with the same tool, <clears throat> knowing that if if uh, I didn't want to be chasing the Z height on those on those two features to make sure they they uh, fit into the fixture accurately. So with that, uh, we'll just mention. I think I I talked about being able to probe it here. Um, yeah, I think that's good. I think uh, hopefully that gives you guys some ideas. Uh, if you took away one thing out of this, that's that's uh, mission accomplished. I think you had some stuff to talk about uh, at the end, and it looks like we're coming to the end. Did you have any anything to add, Al? Uh, no, I think the, the the big things you hit on were were super good. Sort of this idea of uh, palletizing parts, regardless of if if you use your uh, homebrew palletizing system or uh, an off-the-shelf one like the Pearson one, uh, maybe a Mitico one you mentioned where it actually loads the machine in and out. Um, thinking about what your pallet is, I'm glad you hit on that. This idea of combining various fixturing techniques, so you got a pallet plus Mighty Bites. Um, maybe you don't need to open it, but if you just show where CAM samples is, Tim, you, uh, good for everybody to know we just added, we had an intern that added. Um, most of the Mighty Byte product line because it is a big part of machining is how you uh, how you model and define your fixtures so you can find those those in there um, and then this idea of I guess the other thing I, I picked out on this was this idea of uh, labeling and making sure that you well document the fixture for future use and, and probably the most subtle thing is the thought that goes into, and it's very visual here, the thought that goes into chip evacuation um, to make sure you're consistently getting chips out of the way, both so it's clean for loading and unloading, uh, and so that uh, there's not chips in the way when you're coming around a part. So on one part, you get a good service finish, and on the next part, there's chips left over from the last one. So um, making that a, a consideration of your fixture design is, 
another great tip that you shared. And, and probably the more subtle thing, and I like how you colorized it, uh, using the brass, people might say, well, why, why would I use the brass pit bulls? Just thinking about the fact that I don't really want to leave a nick on the side of my, my part. Yeah, the steels, you know, they, they leave, you know, a mark for sure. And the brass, um, you know, I, I call them micro scratches, right? So they're, they're not really deforming or changing the shape of it, but uh, it's just a little softer. And, and um, you know, there's people put mylar in between, you know, these, these and their part if they're very, very cosmetic. But just be aware of the different options you have. If you've used soft jaws, I know a lot of people, uh, struggle with these little micro scratches you know I think Instagram is actually uh, as wonderful as it is I think everybody's on there trying to brag about these mirror finishes we're all creating and it's probably sucked out some productivity of some of our days trying to show off how shiny our parts can be when at the end of the day a lot of us just need to make parts that are, are meet the print so and uh, not um, not only is it you know completely you know functionally and in, in the ingenuity ingenuity that you use to put it together uh, and put all those pieces together, it just looks great. It it flows. It has like this organic look. Um, yeah, it's thanks. pretty pretty awesome. And I love how you had those relief holes, so when you flip it over, you're able to put the Allen key through. Uh, totally brilliant. Just just love the way you did yeah. it. And um, I appreciate. It. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the the markings I, we often see coming from the medical industry, where it's a requirement often to make sure that the uh, operator can't get the part in the wrong way. And so it's, yeah. it's a really good um, uh, habit to have to mark up your fixtures to make sure that the, the parts in the stock goes in correctly. But I think it's awesome, Tim. It's just amazing. To, to see the right. work you do every good every input. Uh, as soon as I see your Instagram and I just like follow it's just amazing stuff that you're doing Tim. I definitely appreciate the input. Uh, Al mentioned uh, the cam samples and uh, so just to kind of hit up where that's at if you go all the way down to your data panel uh, cam samples are in there. Uh, I kind of bug Al to add some little things here and there and there's just a ton of really good stuff in there but you'll find in work holding, the Mighty Byte, we just added those. Pearson work holding does some awesome stuff. Saunders, you know, there's some cool stuff there. Uh, I would recommend checking it out uh, fairly often because um, Al's pretty good about getting his team and, and different people to, to add things in there pretty pretty often. In fact, that, um, that sheet metal part we just did in our last webinar. So, you awesome. know, within a week, Al was able to get that into the uh, cam uh, sample. So that's uh, awesome, Al. Thanks. Yeah, close so. up. We've lots of vendors reaching out, sending us files. We have wanted to make sure we clean them up before we put them in. So you'll notice when we put the pit bull stuff in, we added some surfaces to help you align the parts into your design. Um, but we've got uh, a good backlog of of data sets from vendors that need to get added. So that'll that'll be updating a lot. So so Wayne, I know we're running a little late, but we promised some peeks at what's in development. CJ standing by. So. Um, Tim, thanks for walking through this. Wayne, why don't you stop the recording? Let's let CJ show his screen. Um, we pointed last time we showed you some turning updates to parametric confinements. Uh, there's been additional work that's been released now and additional work has started happening in regards to Chuck. Um, so I thought I'd give CJ five minutes to, to give the people that stuck around this webinar a peek at what's coming in the future. So uh, we'll stop the recording. This is just for people here live. Uh, and CJ, we can, we can see your screen.